Sigrid is a political activist and a children's book lover. <laughs> in our community and a member of the Northampton Committee to Stop Wars. Red Revolution, Green Revolution looks at how socialist political ideas influence Chinese agricultural practices and the concepts of science and modernization on which those practices are based. Sigrid points to the ways in which <coughs> Maoist anti-technocratic ideas have influenced some of the sa sustainability movements of modern day China, and she draws attention to the deep differences between our own ideas about the relationship between politics and science and those of China, where science is not a separate sphere, but pervaded by politics through and through. Please welcome Sigrid Schmalz. Thank you all so much um, for coming. It is really an honor and just deeply moving to see you all here. I just feel so blessed to be a part of um, these different communities um, who come together um, for this. This is it's just, it's just wonderful and really just wonderful to have your support. Um, this book emerged out of a desire to be relevant not only to my academic communities, um, but also to my activist community. Uh, I'm a historian who specializes in the history of science in socialist era China. And there was a time, and some of you remember that time very well, when this subject was of obvious importance to politically active people in the US. So during the 1970s, many leftists and also many more liberal leaning people went to China looking for alternatives to what they saw as the problems of capitalism in our own society. And I've had the great privilege of speaking with Francis Crow, with Ward Morehouse, with Patricia Lee Lewis, and others in our community who traveled to China then and found that kind of inspiration. And that was part of kind of the growth of this project, was having those conversations. Many of the people who went to China at that time were very interested in the alternative ways that socialist China seemed to suggest one could practice science. People involved in medicine were concerned about unequal access to health care and eager to find in China an example of how things might be done better. People involved in insect control science in this country were concerned about the way chemical corporations had influenced scientific research to focus on solutions that involved massive applications of the chemical insecticides that they themselves, those corporations, were producing. Uh, the American scientists who traveled to China in the 1970s were excited by the possibility of science practiced without that kind of corporate influence. And even people involved in researching earthquakes were intrigued by the approach that China had taken in tapping farmers' knowledge about animal behavior prior to earthquakes <laughs> and in mobilizing the masses to monitor conditions and so help predict when and where an earthquake would occur. In short, there was a time when any topic in my field would have been seen as interesting and important uh, to the people that I hang around with. Um, but China today doesn't serve as that kind of model for a number of reasons, right? We know more about what happened during the Mao era, and China today doesn't serve as that kind of model for leftists. And so it just it involves a lot more thinking about how to make that bridge, about how to be relevant to people, how to be able to say something that, um, that people are going to you know, be interested in hearing. Um, so fortunately, when I was searching for the subject of my second book project, something really exciting was happening uh, n right next door to me. A group of people, um, some of whom are here, um, Paige Bridgens, Lisa DePiano, and Molly Merritt originally, um, were creating a community-supported agriculture project based on permaculture principles on public conservation land right just the next door to me. And the project was called Montview Neighborhood Farm. I was really thrilled um, about this when I first heard about it. There were lots of things to love about that project. But what excited me most about the idea of it was the way that these people envisioned bringing together technological change that is transforming the actual practices of farming on the one hand, and on the other hand, social and political change that is transforming how people relate to one another, work together, share power, and identify solutions to create a more just society. And I should note here, I think it's okay to note here, that this was not an easy endeavor. Um, and certainly there were some pretty big challenges in that project. In the end, it's probably fair to say that those challenges you know, made it hard to go on. Um, but I, looking back on that, that is still, having been a part of that, is still such a meaningful thing to me. And it just, you know, it made such a difference in my thinking, in my growth, and I'm just forever grateful to have been um, a part of that. I find inspiration in what was envisioned and what was accomplished in, um, at that farm. 
Um, and so part of it, you know, I, I was I was never really farming or anything like that. I was my my son um, Ferdinand was an intern, I would say, at the, at the farm, <laughs> when he was one or two years old, um, uh, pruning with Paige and, and all of this. Um, and that was kind of uh, so I, I enjoyed it vicariously, but and also just kind of looking at it um, as somebody who thinks about science and social context. I was really inspired by the recognition that knowledge, in this case knowledge about how to grow food, was inseparable from the social, political, and economic relationships from which that knowledge emerges. So if corporate capitalism gives us monocropping and chemical inten chemically intensive agriculture, the idea is that community organizations might be able to produce something like permaculture, right? So that there's some kind of link between the technologies and the, the social context and political context and economic context. Um, it should be able to give us something more sustainable, more beautiful, more wholesome to human and animal life. I think this, um, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing the way um, the farmers felt about it, but I, I, this is what I took from, from the philosophy that they brought. Um, and so, um, this really reminded me very much of some of the inspiration that socialist China had offered to Americans in the 1970s and that as some kind of weird throwback it continues to offer to me, uh, even knowing what I know as a historian, it continues to be that kind of inspiration. So it occurred to me that writing a book about agricultural science in socialist era China was a way that I could be relevant to people in my community. Mm -hmm. And I tried that idea out by organizing a little workshop and inviting people from UMass and from the Montview Farm community, again some of the people here were, were that. Uh, we met in the vegetable shed at Town Farm, uh, Ben and Una's farm just next to Montview Farm. Um, and I look, and we looked together at a bunch of primary sources I had collected that spoke to both the political vision and the lived experiences of farming in Mount Ara, China. And that event was in many ways a dream come true for me to be able to take the academics and put it in a, in a community, in a really rural community setting. Um, now that the book is finally out, I really hope that it does some justice to the communities, the academic community, you know, the history department that has nurtured me, and um, the activist community that's nurtured me as well. Um, and I hope that it will be of interest to people who are doing really important work to transform farming and through it to transform society as a whole in our here and now. So what I'm going to do now is to read some selections from the book interspersed with some more informal explanations. So I've kind of cut and pasted some stuff in here. I won't be actually holding the book and, and reading from it because I couldn't figure out a way to make it, to do that and make it make sense. Um, but I've, I've drawn from that and put it in here. Um, the book begins by exploring the difference between two ways of looking at science and technology, which are re represented by these terms red revolution and green revolution. So in 1968, the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, coined this term green revolution. He said, quote, record yields, harvests of unprecedented size, and crops now in the ground demonstrate that throughout much of the developing world, and particularly in Asia, we are on the verge of an agricultural revolution. It is not a violent red revolution like that of the Soviets, nor is it a white revolution like that of the Shah of Iran. I call it the green revolution. So this term green revolution, which meant the promotion of modern high yielding varieties of crops that depended on high amounts of chemical fertilizers and chemical insecticides, was from the very beginning conceived as an alternative to red revolutions. The idea was that if lo the lives of poor farmers in developing countries could be improved by increasing their crop yields, they might be less likely to turn to political revolution of the kind experienced in the Soviet Union, China, and elsewhere. So this is what we call a technocratic approach. So faith in that technology alone without political <laughs> transformation can fix our problems. And this was very much not how Mao and other Chinese radicals saw things. There's a common view that Mao and his followers were anti-science. And I argue in this book that this was not at all the case. They were not anti-science, but they did have a very different view as to how science should work. And this was epitomized by a very often quoted 1963 statement by Chairman Mao, where he said, class struggle, the struggle for production, and scientific experiment are the three great revolutionary movements for building a mighty socialist country. These movements are a sure guarantee that communists will be free from bureaucracy and immune against revisionism and dogmatism and will forever remain invincible. 
Uh, high hopes, right? <laughs> uh, for Mao and other radicals in socialist China, science was a revolutionary movement alongside the more familiar political commitments to class struggle, that is the effort to combat power inequities in society, and the struggle for production, that is the effort to increase material resources to feed the people. And so for Mao and others in China, the introduction of any new agricultural technologies could be politically legitimate only if it proceeded through red revolutionary means. As at Montview Neighborhood Farm, technological change, that is changes in the technical knowledge and practices of farming itself, were inseparable from political and social transformation. And this set of transformations was what in socialist China they called scientific farming, so hence the other part of the, um, of the title. One of the premises of this book is that scientific farming meant very different things to different people. And so the experiences of Chinese scientists, peasants, local cadres, technicians, um, and the so-called educated youth uh, each receive individual attention in separate chapters in the book. Chapter one introduces the elements of state policy and ideology that bore most directly on agricultural science. Uh, one of the most important of these concepts um, was the concept of Tu science, so this term Tu, T-U in, in uh, romanization. Tu denoted a cluster of related meanings, native, Chinese, local, rustic, mass, crude, that contrasted with another term, yang, which meant foreign, western, elite, professional, and ivory tower. And this formed a radical vision of science in Mao era China, that is a science produced by the broad masses for the fulfillment of socialist revolutionary goals. The ideal was for Tu and Yang to work together so mm -hmm. that China could benefit both from the professional research of university agricultural scientists and from the practical knowledge of peasants working on the ground. Now related to this combination of Tu and Yang was the policy of forming grassroots scientific experiment groups organized throughout the countryside on a three-in-one basis. So old peasants with practical experience, educated youth with revolutionary zeal, and local cadres with correct political understanding would work together to identify needs and develop solutions. I should note too, it's funny because now that I've been directing the Social Thought and Political Economy prog program at UMass, our committees are also three in one committees, although I had to be the one to say it and mention this to people, but it's faculty, <laughs> staff, and students. And the idea is very similar. It's a kind of a combination standpoint epistemology where people come from these different perspectives and they all bring different kinds of knowledge to the table and you're supposed to come up with better solutions because, because of that um, diversity. And sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't work so well, but as we all know. Right. Um, okay, so the significance the state accorded to the work of these groups demonstrated the inseparability of society and politics on one hand and science and technology on the other. So for example, when a team of teenage girls named the March 8th Agricultural Science Group in honor of International Women's Day used pig manure as fertilizer to increase production in a lackluster field, they were understood to have struck a blow for scientific farming, not because their technology was new, right? Putting manure on fields is a technology old as the hills. And not, sad to say, because it was ecologically sustainable. It was ecologically sustainable, sustainable but that was not a priority at the time, sadly. Um, but the reason that this was understood to be scientific farming was because it helped them to overturn unscientific old sexist ideas about women's farming abilities. So far from being viewed as an apolitical force capable of solving pro problems without revolution, scientific farming was embraced in socialist China as a means for the radical transformation of society. Chapters two and three consider the experiences of two Chinese agricultural scientists and how they navigated this binary um, between uh, rustic Tu science and professional Yang science. These chapters challenge the widespread notion that the story of scientists in the Mao era was nothing but political oppression and tragedy. There was plenty of political oppression and tragedy, and I don't pretend that there, um, that there wasn't. Um, but there's also lots more that hasn't been told, and these two scientists uh, and their um, accomplishments are important, I think, for us to understand this period fully. So chapter two introduces an entomologist, an insect scientist named Pujalong, 
who received his PhD at the University of Minnesota in 1949, and then dedicated the rest of his career to aiding Chinese agriculture through the biological control of insect pests. Mm -hmm. He was especially important in developing ways to control insect pests through the release of parasitic wasps on a massive scale, thus avoiding costly and dangerous insecticides. And before anyone gets the heebie-jeebies, these are really tiny wasps. They're not scary at all. They're kind of cute. They're very, very small. Um, they don't bite anybody, uh, any people. Um, a research scientist at the prestigious Sun Yat-sen University, he was without doubt an elite young scientist. However, his strong political commitment to socialism and his affinity for peasants led him to success in the realm of Tu science also. And he fared comparatively well even amid the anti-intellectual politics of the Cultural Revolution. Huh. Had a few bumps along the way, but overall this is a success story in the Cultural Revolution. Chapter 3 turns to Yuan Longping, who epitomized a humbler face of Mao era science, though in the end he became far more famous than Pu Zhilong uh, ever would. He was educated in China, uh, unlike Pu, you know, he didn't have that classy, you know, American degree. Um, he, upon graduation, was assigned to a backwater agricultural college, um, but nonetheless he conducted important research on hybrid rice technology during the Cultural Revolution, and he came to fame in the late 1970s, eventually gaining the moniker Father of Hybrid Rice. Now, the story of hybrid rice in China should interest critics of agribusiness today um, because you know there are many problems with with these technologies but one of the most problematic aspects um, in, of new seed technologies and this includes both the production of hybrid rice and also the use of GMOs is the way that it strips farmers of the ability or even the right to preserve and select their own seed for future plantings plantings so no, however you feel about you know GMOs in terms of you know um, the danger to the environment or anything like that there's a um, there's a concern about um, food sovereignty about seed sovereignty about the rights of local people to um, and the ability of local people to save their, and, uh, their own seeds select their own seed um, uh, breed their own, um, own crops but in China the introduction of hybrid seed was really unusual because of the emphasis on building local expertise and self-reliance. So the idea was not that these communities would be relying on big companies or even big state agencies to provide the seed, but rather that local people would learn to do it themselves. Um, to the extent of sending young peasants from local communities, identifying somebody from each community, um, and bringing them um, to the island of Hainan, um, to learn how to do this, and then they would go back to their communities and learn to do it. It was, it was quite tricky, and people who talk about it said, oh my gosh, it was, re it was really hard to do. But the idea was that the, the um, skill would be cultivated locally and the control would be, would be local. Um, it's hard to know how the system would have fared, um, if it would have lasted, if political conditions had continued to favor this kind of mass science um, philosophy and local self-reliance. Um, as we know, um, you know, by the time hybrid rice really uh, took off, it was only a few years later that things changed really profoundly in China. And so um, along with that, the, um, you know, in China today, uh, peasants get their, um, get their seed from, um, you know, from a big um, Chinese seed corporation. Not, uh, they don't do it locally anymore. Chapters four and five move beyond the scientists to explore the experiences of people in rural communities. Scientific farming radically reorganized agricultural authority in rural communities, creating a vast core of what were called peasant technicians with knowledge of a wide range of new farming practices, including both chemical and organic practices, both labor-intensive and labor-saving practices. In some cases, scientific farming in socialist China, as elsewhere, threatened to replace existing forms of knowledge. So this is a real problem, right, with these modernizing technologies, is that indigenous knowledge forms um, get pushed aside. But in other cases, it helped codify and promote existing forms of knowledge possessed by Chinese peasants. So for example, the use of nitrogen-rich cover crops to nourish the soil between harvests had been known in China for centuries, but this did not mean that farmers all over China were uh, uniformly growing these crops, right? It might be known in one area and not in another. So many people experienced this as a new technology, or at least were introduced to new types of plants through this scientific farming um, movement. 
So for them, this, this term scientific farming, if we talk about it today, it might call to mind the colorful cover crops that flowered in early spring on the terraced hills. And I heard this described to me so beautifully, a level of red on the bottom, purple in the middle, and green at the top, representing the different varieties, especially suited to the different conditions. Chapter four explores peasant, farming, uh, peasant participation in scientific farming, focusing especially on the dual view of peasants as experienced and backward. This was a central contradiction in Mao era ideology. The state very much wanted to celebrate peasants for their knowledge of agriculture that came from their own experience of labor, but the state simultaneously had a very skeptical or even hostile attitude toward traditional knowledge because of its association with the oppressive old society. And this, I think, is something we maybe don't think about enough. Um, you know, we, we have a tendency right now to embrace indigenous knowledge perhaps somewhat uncritically. And there was a time not that long ago when leftists were maybe more likely um, to have a more skeptical attitude toward tradition and uh, concerns about the kinds of um, oppressive social relationships um, of the past. And so, you know, I think we want to we want to be thinking about that, right? I mean, to what extent um, is tradition uh, or specific traditions oppressive, and to what extent um, are they, um, you know, uh, poten potentially liberatory, especially when used um, to combat um, uh, corporate or um, imperialist pressures? These are these are questions I think we need to think more about. Uh, chapter five looks at many of these same issues, but specifically from the perspective of local political cadres and agricultural technicians who were caught between state mandates from above and the realities of the rural communities that they served. This sometimes meant using the state's own rhetoric of self-reliance to resist the imposition of technologies that did not suit local conditions. And sometimes it meant secretly planting traditional varieties of rice that the peasants favored out of sight of officials who wanted to convert all production to higher yielding modern varieties. So there was some negotiation there and local, the local state agents were kind of on the ground um, figuring these things out. Chapters six and seven take up the story of the educated youth who participated in vast numbers in socialist China's rural scientific experiment movement and for whom agricultural science was at times an amusing diversion and at other times a much graver, a much more serious undertaking. Science mattered to many youth because it was both revolutionary and intellectual and so it offered opportunities for both political glory and personal advancement. And in some cases, youth had extraordinarily meaningful and positive experiences when they participated in scientific experiment groups. They were able to exercise the knowledge they had gained in school and apply it to real problems in the countryside. For example, by cultivating microbial fertilizer or by introducing a new variety of rice or by helping with the research that used wasps to control insect pests. These were all exciting things for people to participate in. And in some cases, it was rural youth who you know, had, would never have had this kind of opportunity except for these for these programs and who actually then in some cases went on to um, meaningful work in the area of agricultural science. But the challenges these youth faced were often really too great. And if you think about your own high school experiences trying to get chemistry experiments to work using the rudimentary equipment in your, you know, at least this was how I always experienced it in my classrooms, like this experiment never worked, you know, um, and that, you know, would give you this sense of frustration or even maybe concern of getting a bad grade. For these youth, the consequences, the stakes were so much higher, right? Because if they, their experiment failed, it wasn't just about getting a bad grade or, you know, being frustrated because, you know, this never works. But, you know, they may have, they failed the revolution, you know, they were charged with doing this important revolutionary sci scientific experiment is a great revolutionary movement and you messed it up, right? Um, or even, you know, even more sad, I mean, hearing from a woman whose experiment failed and she realized that, you know, the land that the peasants had given her to do this experiment and raise this new, uh, grow this new, um, variety of sorghum that it had failed and you know, people was, were really hungry in that mm -hmm. village and there were cases where you know children starved because their you know mother did not have milk and you know this the, this land I mean the, the, the stakes extremely high and it was not particularly easy for them to um, take on these these big um, these big tasks so the epilogue then takes up the legacies of both green and red revolutions under dramatically altered political, economic, social, and cultural conditions. 
The technological changes affected by scientific farming are an underappreciated source of China's current economic growth. At the same time, they are to blame for much environmental destruction. So that kind of double-edged sword is very much still with us. Um, but what I think is most interesting is how contemporary movements to transform Chinese agriculture draw from the radical politics of the Mao era, though not usually in very explicit ways. So for example, in Guangxi province, there's a fascinating project going on right now called the Participatory Plant Breeding Project that calls for scientists to learn from peasants, and especially women peasants, um, about their, um, the way they select maize seeds um, for propagation, um, and for peasants to become active participants in this scientific research. The, the researchers, um, the academics who are running this, don't reference Mao era ideas about two science or three in one combinations or any of this, but the influence just could not be clearer in their rhetoric. I mean, you can, it maps so perfectly. So I have some hope that this history that I've written here is still of relevance today. The history presents all the subtleties and complexities created as real people grappled with the enormous upheavals that accompanied the political and technological revolutions of 1960s to 70s China. But despite these many irresolvable ambiguities, the book also supports a number of strong conclusions about the history of China's red and green revolutions and the relationship between science and politics more broadly. So to begin with, I argue that the political fluctuations of Mao-era China cannot be characterized as struggles between pro-science and anti-science factions, which is how it is often framed in the literature. Technocrats and radicals had different perspectives on how science should work, but both groups embraced science as a core value. By the same token, excessive faith in the possibilities of science and modernization presented very similar dangers in the hands of radicals and technocrats. The radicals' insistence on putting politics in command of science and technology did not result in the kind of critique of green revolution technologies that was needed from the standpoint of environmental health, and it fell short also in the realm of labor and social justice. A lot of these um, technologies that we see put into place are done um, with a lot of sweat and a lot of blood on the part of the, of the peasants, um, and it was not, not always just. But I would say this does not suggest that science and technology should ideally be separate from politics. This idea like, oh, there is so much political influence on science and that should never happen. Um, I argue instead that the Mao era did not have too much politics in science, but rather too little in the way of rigorous political critique of unsustainable technologies and too much in the way of violent factionalism and persecution. So there's a difference between politics and persecution, right? The people of the world still need to figure out how to do agricultural science differently. We need to be able to trust that technologies ostensibly developed to increase our capacity to feed people are not in fact riding roughshod over social and environmental needs to profit private interests. We need to be able to insist that social and political relations matter in the equation. And we need to be able to understand these issues as they relate to the history of a place home to one-fifth of the world's population and poised to make or break our global future. Socialist Chinese efforts to affect a politically engaged philosophy of science fell far short of the hopes they kindled, nor does any historical example yet meet the task. However, the history explored here contains much that may inspire a rethinking of dominant assumptions about science and society. And having engaged in such reconsideration, we will be better positioned to confront problems of hunger and sustainability in appropriately social and political ways, and to avoid the pitfalls of imagining purely technological solutions to the problems we face together. Um, thank you so much. This is I'm ex very excited to read the book, um, and I'll say that coming from South Asia, these things are so very real um, today in, in, in the way that, that these particular questions are very much in, in the present politics. Um, and and I, I think what, what seems really interesting about what you're suggesting is that, you know, what we see in the discourse in South Asia is that there's, there's big GMO, whatever, mm -hmm. Monsantos, and then there's people who are fighting back and saying, you know, indigenous methods and these sorts of things. And, and I think what's really interesting and I wonder if you would accept the idea of a more sort of democratizing science. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And if you see this as a sort of, um, 
as a way of bridging some of those gaps. This is a sort of example of, of not being anti-science or sort of rejecting it, but sort of democratizing it in some mm -hmm. way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really true, and, and there's there is there's a lot of really good work on South Asia. So I benefited a lot, especially from Akhil Gupta's um, um, book on something. Do, uh, I can't even remember the title of it anymore. Oh, it's been a, it's been a while since I looked at all this stuff. But but I felt like the, there's it when I look at South Asia, I feel like the um, attention being given to this is such that there's already um, even a sophisticated critique of the critique. Like the conversation has been much richer, I think. So for example, with the um, kind of the turn to indigenous knowledge as a way to combat um, green revolution technologies and um, kind of colonialist modernization um, more generally, um, we have that, and that's important. And then we have people like Gupta who are, you know, saying, "Okay, let's step back and see how this question of indigenous knowledge is, in fact, essentializing people and kind of lumping people into this state of indigeneity that they may or may not even want to be in, or and et cetera." So I, I feel like the work that's been done in South Asia is way ahead of of what we've done. Um, in China, and I've, I've benefited a lot from it. Yeah, I mean, I think democratizing science is really, you know, it's a, it's a good way of putting it. Um, there's probably a lot of different ways to think about that, and so that could be, you know, understood in a very kind of liberal capitalist con um, context, and that's not what we're seeing in, in the Mao era. Um, at the same time, you know, what we saw in the Mao era often did not, in fact, result in uh, democratizing science. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I, think that, I think that's where it's at. And then, it, you know, part of the question is, what do we mean by democracy, you know, and um, what kinds of transformations, political and economic, might have to happen in order for us to get there? Mm -hmm. But, yeah, great question. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your interviewees, um, mm -hmm. how you found, especially because you mentioned how politics infuses all of this, that there's mm -hmm. no sort of separate realm of science. How did you find people to interview? How welcoming were they of being interviewed? How forthcoming were they? Um, were they nostalgic looking back towards this period? Mm -hmm. Were they critical? I'd mm -hmm. love to just hear your experience talking about Yeah, you know, it's my research methodology tends to be catch as catch can. I go out there and like whatever I can find, whoever I can talk to, whether it's a cab driver, whether it's a, you know, somebody I bump into, whether it's a colleague who can introduce me to someone. Um, a number of my interviewees came actually through a friendship that I've had since 1994, is that 22 years now, um, with a woman. Um, I was, the first time I went to China, I went to the um, town than town of, of Yangshuo, which some of you may know, um, very, very beautiful place and had just kind of come on the map. Lonely Planet had just found <laughs> it and said, this is the place to go if you're an independent backpacker. This is such a beautiful place. There's hardly anybody there and except for a few little coffee shops. And so I got there and um, a young woman, actually the same age as me, so uh, maybe a year older than, uh, she's, she is, she's a year older than me, so I was 22 and she was 23. Um, came and found me in this little coffee shop. So not only had people figured out to make coffee shops, but they had also, they had also um, a number of young women with high school um, educations, high school English from the countryside, had figured out that um, these independent backpackers coming to Yangshuo <laughs> wanted to see the real China. And so she approached me in this coffee shop and wanted to be my tour guide. And at first I was all snotty. I was like, oh, I don't need a tour guide because I know Chinese and whatever. And then I suddenly, she said, oh, that's OK. And then she switched into Chinese and we started talking. And this was great for me. And then I realized I'm making a big blunder here. She wants to take me to her village and introduce me to her family. And I'm telling her I don't need a tour guide. This is crazy. So um, I went with her. And at that time, you know, that it was all male. You like, so we kept in touch by mail, um, and all these years later, um, this was really my entry um, to, to um, Village China, and so she was able to take me around uh, and introduce me to a number of people in villages outside um, of Yangshuo. Um, and um, so that was one, you know, one way that I got to talk to people. And people, you know, I would say it's a it's a range. You know, it people some people were you know happy to talk because they they had felt like they had participated in something meaningful and they wanted to talk about it. Some people, especially people who had, you know, more negative experience or especially disappointed